last uh, but not least, we have Senen Florenza uh, that will introduce our politics and society section for tonight. Thank you and welcome him. So Senen, um, well, right now he serves as a president of the delegate committee and general director of the European Institute of the Mediterranean, uh, with the range of executive president, chair of Euro uh, MISI SO General Assembly, and director of the Quarterly uh, AFCAR Ideas and of the EMD, o sea, the Mediterranean uh, Yearbook. So, uh, thank you, Senen, for coming. And uh, the first question will be, how can political initiatives and policies in the Mediterranean contribute to creating sustainable jobs and employment opportunities? Okay, so thank you very much in the first place. It's a pleasure to be with you, with the young people, and, uh, well, the responsible people from the school as well, but mainly uh, because it's, it's this kind of uh, encounter with people working on Mediterranean affairs. In fact, uh, yes, I am uh, the uh, executive president, in fact, of the European Institute of the Mediterranean. Uh, this is an institution that was created back in 89. Uh, it is a Spanish institution, although it is a bit complex because it's a consortium between the Spanish Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Municipality of Barcelona, and the regional government of Catalonia. Uh, but its mission is not to promote nor Spanish interests to Barcelona or Catalonia's interests, but to work according to its statutes to promote Euro-Mediterranean uh, cooperation. Uh, that's it, uh, what has been called traditionally the Barcelona process or the Euro-Mediterranean uh, partnership. Uh, uh, in fact, we had been involved since the beginning uh, in that project, which is I would say the most structured cooperation operation in the whole world, I would say, uh, uh, between two groups of countries which share the same space in the Mediterranean, but have historically different traditions, although in the same shared space. Uh, and so the Mediterranean has traditionally been a very complex region. Eh? Uh, but the fact is that uh, it was perceived that uh, after, after a few decades of the creation of the European community, nowadays European Union, it was a big success, uh, but the perception was that we had a problem in the south because there was too much difference between the countries in the north of the Mediterranean and in the south of the Mediterranean, and this was the main purpose of this huge operation, the Euro-Mediterranean Partnership, uh, to overcome these differences, which is a difficult endeavor. Uh, so we, we have been working, I mean, not the Institute, of course, but the European Commission, uh, the whole of the European institutions, uh, the governments of the countries in the European uh, community, governments in partner countries south of east of the Mediterranean, and you will see, as you can imagine, that there are uh, lights and, and, and shadows in the results so far. But we still believe that this is the best project to uh, put forward and to work for, because in our perception is the, the, the best one to promote the growth and the economy uh, and the modernization, I would say, of the whole of the societies uh, north and south of the Mediterranean together. Mm -hmm. So it was uh, put in motion in, uh, after the enlargement in 86, when Spain and, and Portugal, just after uh, Greece, joined the European uh, communities, we brought with us our priorities, mainly Spain, which were Latin America, 
which was a bit forgotten by the uh, European uh, uh, community, and Mediterranean in the Arab world. At that point, that was something very important. Uh, we took advantage of the fact of the transformation in, certain, in Central Europe, because as you know, in 89, uh, the, the wall of Berlin fell and things went very fast. I was at that time, I am a career diplomat, and I was at that time a consul general in Berlin from 92 to 96. When I arrived in Berlin, there were still about 200,000 uh, Warsaw Pact and Soviet soldiers just around Berlin. So it was uh, difficult to overcome. And of course, the first priority for Germany was the reunification of Germany. Not everybody agreed on that in Europe and not even inside Germany, because many people in Western part of Germany thought it would be too expensive and they wouldn't like to go again under uh, the ages of, uh, of Berlin and, and the Prussians, so to say, and in the rest of Europe, all the more. Uh, President Mitterrand said, j'aime tellement l'Allemagne que je préfère qu'il y en ait deux plutôt qu'une. Uh, uh, which was a way to try to, to put problems uh, on the road. But, uh, of course, it was a big priority, the unification, uh, and not only the occasion for the unification, but as well, Germany was extremely interested, as it is still, of course, to attract all other countries that had been hidden behind the Iron Curtain uh, to Western Europe. Uh, and so they, they designed a huge policy neighbors for the neighbors, the new countries uh, that appeared in the scene after the fall of the Berlin Wall. And at that point, of course, then Southern European countries, mainly Spain, France, Italy, uh, asked, well, okay, we, are, we agree on that, provided that there is at the same time an important European policy for the south and east of the Mediterranean. And this is how uh, the two big projects were launched, the neighbors uh, policy and the programs Fare and Tathis that were to help countries in Central Europe that were then to join later on the European Union and for the countries neighbors of the neighbors, so the new neighbors now, eh? uh, for example, Ukraine. Uh, and at the same time, uh, to launch uh, in 95 this, this big policy toward the south. In fact, it is a, a key point in the consortium. Well, the point was that uh, uh, it was taken advantage of that, and is a key point, I was saying, in the, in the Cannes uh, summit in the spring of 95, where the decision was taken to launch these two big policies, one toward the east of Europe, which gave us a result, the, the, the dynamics that may led to the enlargement uh, of the European communities uh, to incorporate in the European Union the countries in Central Europe, as they are now members since uh, 2004, most of them, this big enlargement of 10 countries joining the European Union. And at the same time, it was decided in that uh, summit in 1995 to launch the, Euro the Barcelona process, which was known, which is the Euro-Mediterranean Partnership. So what was that? Uh, there are several, uh, uh, um, several phases in that, several periods. The classical period, I would say, of the Barcelona process is the launching of it. It was uh, a period of uh, big hope because even after the Madrid conference and the Oslo agreements, uh, it seemed that we could even solve the uh, Middle East, uh, Palestinian, Arab, and Israeli conflict. Things have not been uh, going as good as we expected at that moment, but that was the epiphany moment, I would say, the, the very optimistic moment in which this Euro-Mediterranean partnership was launched. And it was, uh, uh, as I was saying, a project designed 
to, to build around the Mediterranean, as it was said then, an area of peace and stability, which has been has proved to be very complicated, as you know, with many crises that came from farther east uh, uh, and, and Central Asia. Then an area of shared economic progress. To some point that has happened, but not enough, as uh, we will say uh, later on. And an area of understanding and comprehension among peoples and cultures around the Mediterranean. So these were the three main uh, goals of this, of this uh, Barcelona process or Euro-Mediterranean partnership. But it had to have, uh, so that there was a, an engine which had to be economic. Eh? And that was the engagement to build a free trade zone and the programs uh, for financial support of reforms through technical assistance and financial support to reform in uh, south of eastern Mediterranean. It worked uh, in 8, 2008, and I will finish with that and we'll continue with the other questions. Uh, we went for another step, a very important one, uh, when it was uh, the Union for the Mediterranean was created to continue this Barcelona process. In fact, then the official name is the Barcelona Process Union for the Mediterranean, um, which was institutionalized with the creation of a general secretariat, which is here in Barcelona, in uh, Pedro Alves Palace, to launch practical problems to go to the, the, same, the same end. Hmm? Uh, we can say that from a political point of view, things have been much more complicated as we were expected at the beginning because uh, of, uh, well, September 11 in New York, the attacks uh, elsewhere, uh, war in uh, Afghanistan, uh, uh, stupid invasion of Iraq by a coalition in which we unfortunately were <laughs> joining with other countries, and then all these complications that you know, because unfortunately they have to be every day in the, in the news. Eh? And in, in recently, two other complicated issues with the coronavirus, as incredible as it might have seemed, we had literally to stop the world for a couple of years, and then start working again, and now with the war uh, in Ukraine, which is further complicating it. But since I have zero minutes, I will stop here for this question. Thank you. Uh, uh, okay, actually we can continue probably uh, following the next question that is, how can political cooperation and integration among Mediterranean countries contribute to economic development and growth of the region? Yes. Okay, how can cooperation, political economic cooperation in the Mediterranean uh, help economic development? There was one ingredient that uh, was left in my previous explanation in the general approach of the Barcelona process or, and the Union for the Mediterranean nowadays, which was the idea that this could not be done only through cooperation between governments, that it was a huge endeavor uh, of modernization uh, of societies, of mentalities, uh, reproaching uh, countries from north and south of the Mediterranean with very different traditions. Uh, and therefore, that, as I was saying, this cannot be done only through cooperation among governments, that civil societies had to be participating very actively and that was what was being promoted since the beginning of this process in 95. So that, uh, for example, we at the European Institute of the Mediterranean, we are the secretariat, for example, of Euromesco. Euromesco is a network of 106 think tanks and institutes as we are from all over the European Union and south of east of the Mediterranean, all the Arab world. Uh, we work together, uh, well, conducting studies on political affairs, economic affairs, social affairs, cultural affairs, etc., uh, in Mediterranean, in Mediterranean uh, countries. Now, mm, 
things have proved, as I was saying before, much more difficult than expected. I was saying that in, back in 95, uh, we were in a moment of a very big hope and optimism, and, and then after that uh, came all these series of disastrous events, uh, mainly provoked uh, in, in its grievous sense by the war uh, in Iraq and all its consequences in the area and around. Uh, but we persist in the idea because we are convinced that the only way for all these countries, especially south and east of the Mediterranean, to prosper uh, is to do it in combination, in association with its neighbors north of the Mediterranean. In fact, uh, we are going into a world where mm, big economic areas will be created. Uh, and big economic areas combining developed countries and developing countries. And this is happening in the Americas, this is happening in Southeast Asia, and this will have to happen in Europe. And I would add, not only as it was conceived in 95 in the Euro-Mediterranean partnership, including the whole of the European Union and the countries in the south of east of the Mediterranean, but including the whole of Africa uh, in the future. Probably this regionalization in the globality, in the globalization, Europe will have to take extremely seriously uh, the development in Africa. And European countries have to be ready to make an effort that it cannot be imagined now by the European citizens. But without that, the European system will not be sustainable. And therefore, we have to take care of the whole of this uh, economic area. Now, we conducted uh, uh, some year, uh, some, uh, a few years back uh, an, uh, a study which was METPRO which was a prospective of the Mediterranean, seeing how it could be uh, by 2030, given different assumptions, and what would be the result. Uh, it was a quantitative analysis with many data and all these things. And there were different, uh, different approaches. One was business as usual. So continue with what we have, which is something, because we have all these efforts that have been building with the uh, Europe Mediterranean Partnership, uh, Union for the Mediterranean, with its projects going on, etc. That uh, would give a result as we have uh, had in recent decades in 1995. Uh, um, from 1995 uh, to 2005, for example, for a country of like Morocco, we could take others, but Morocco has been more stable along the time, so to avoid other interferences, to make things worse, because of wars, because of upheavals, etc., they had during that period of 10 years uh, an average growth of, uh, I think it was something like 1.5%. Since 2005 to 2015 or 16, so in, in the most recent period, uh, uh, they jumped to 3.6, uh, uh, I think, it's something like that, uh, of growth on average along these years. But the point is that this is not enough. To take off, as it was said in the traditional theory of some economists, as Strostov and others, uh, to be a tiger, to say it in a more journalistic uh, language, as the countries in Southeast Asia or previously in Korea, or previously in Japan and others, uh, to, well, Japan would, would be a specific case, but Southeast Asia is clearly the case, the famous tigers uh, uh, in Southeast Asia. You need to have an average growth of 6.5 to 7% per year for at least 15 years. This is a revolution in my view, 
a true revolution that changes a country is not to have thousands of flags or whatever, is to have an average growth above 6.5% for more than 15 years. This is the experience of all countries that have rose from underdevelopment to development. Now we see that even though Morocco, which is probably the country has done the best south and east of the Mediterranean, because they jumped from 1.5 to 3.6, 3.7, and they, 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 they have been uh, make, they have been improving in all senses. I have been traveling to Morocco and as in other countries in, in, in uh, south and east of the Mediterranean, I have seen the progress along the last, uh, I don't know, 30 years. I was living there, I was ambassador of Spain to Tunisia, and I've seen the progress of those, of those countries, although now uh, uh, the bad twist that has taken some of these uh, Arab Springs, then came the Arab summer, and then the summer, and then now the winter, we could say. And so this is a complicated. Uh, uh, and in this study of perspective, which was the best uh, uh, setting that would provide, I have 41 seconds left. Okay, which was the prospect, the, 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 the combination of factors that would give the best economic results? An intermediate stage would be, and that would be a lot, if countries south of the and east of the Mediterranean uh, associated themselves. We wanted to have a free trade zone Euro-Mediterranean in 95. It was written and approved in 95 to be put at work in 2010. Nothing of that has happened because the countries of the southern and eastern Mediterranean among themselves wouldn't agree to have that kind of association and to lower tariffs among them, etc. So what do we have today? A set of free trade zones, Euro, Moroccan, Euro, Tunisian, Euro, uh, uh, Egyptian, etc. Okay, so if that was done among them, then they would jump to, uh, not to 7.5%, but to 4.5, maybe, or something like that, which would be already. Uh, so we conducted a study that was named Le Coup du Nom Maghreb. And it was assessed that uh, the fact that there was no integration among them, at least commercially, etc., uh, represented a loss of about 2% uh, growth per year, which is a lot. Uh, so this is one of the big impediments. Uh, and the best results were when we had a truly internal market comprising the whole of countries of the European Union and the countries south and east of the Mediterranean. So uh, to participate as it, is, as it is proposed in the European uh, policy, uh, uh, neighborhood policy. The neighborhood policy proposed in 2005 already by Romano Prodi and that's still now at work progressively is to offer what was called a stake into the internal market of Europe uh, uh, to the partner countries so that they could develop their exports and attract investments, etc., uh, progressively. But we are going uh, too slow. But if we had that really fully at work, then it, we would have the best chances to attain uh, the required level for a fast developing countries emerging from under development to be a developed countries. This is the ingredients we need. Thank you. We will begin with the questions from the audience, so please. Good afternoon. Yeah. Good afternoon. My name is Santiago Izquierdo. I am a student of the Escola Europea from Barcelona Sport Community. 
And my question is, uh, how do you see the current political and geostrategic dynamics in the Mediterranean region uh, impacting, the, um, impacting the relationship between the European countries and their neighbors in North Africa and the Middle East? Thank you very much. In a very complicated way. <laughs> because, as I was saying, we have all these problems that have appeared. Contrary to the prospects we, have, we had uh, of uh, optimism in '95, then things have gone uh, the worst possible way every time. Uh, and now, after the pandemic, we have the war in Ukraine. And the war in Ukraine, which is, I understand, the main focus of your question, uh, well, it's affecting very much it because uh, we don't know how it will finish, not only the war, but the, the geostrategic setting, the general geostrategic setting, and specifically in the Mediterranean. I mean, uh, somehow we are losing faith in this big project that we had to work together now and so, uh, so, north and south of the Mediterranean for this big project of common understanding, peace and stability, uh, cultural uh, dialogue, etc. Because of the different perception of what's going on and the implications and the outcome of the, of the uh, Ukraine war. Mm -hmm. And the appearance of what is called now the New South. Uh, the New South means that, uh, well, countries like India, Brazil, etc., and most of count developing countries, um, and it's a continuation of the movement that was called of non-aligned countries from the 60s. Uh, it, it has been fading away, that movement, and now it's recovering. Uh, um, and and this, is, this is making a difference between north and south, of, the divide between north and south of the Mediterranean much more intense than before because European countries perceive an extreme vital threat in the aggression of Russia to an independent country as was as is, uh, Ukraine, while countries south and east of the Mediterranean prefer, let's say, to stand by and join this general movement of uh, um, the, the new south, that's called, and uh, this may further weaken this uh, uh, common effort to overcome uh, the divide north and south of the Mediterranean and to bring about a modern, uh, uh, richer societies, etc., uh, south and east of the Mediterranean. Uh, and then the, the, the evolution of the Arab uh, Spring revolutions uh, has not been very promising in that respect, eh? because most of the countries have entrenched in going back into, well, kind of a regime so to the tradition of the authoritarian regimes, which has, in fact, prevented the development in most uh, of the Arab world. And now we are falling back in that. Uh, and so it is the, the well, uh, the key, I remember when I was in Tunisia, people said, well, Spain has received a lot of uh, financial help when it's joined the European Union, and so that's the reason for their uh, development and so on. And I said, no, never was higher than 1 or 1.3% of, of the GNP in Spain. The point, and I was telling my Tunisian friends and counterparts, the rhythm of growth depends on the rhythm of reform. And they were reluctant to reform because they, this, this was an attempt to the privileges of the ones who uh, controlled the policies to be applied in that country as in most other countries in the region. Uh, and now, with this kind of regression, we are seeing now back to the authoritarianism uh, is not very much promising. Uh, so the impact uh, is, is, is important because we are losing faith uh, in this big project that we had, 
uh, of this Euro-Mediterranean partnership. And we will have to go back to that and to, and to overcome this loss of faith uh, to bring about progressive and, and economically, I mean, not only politically, societies in the area. Thank you. We can continue with the next question. Uh, hello, sir. I'm Mario Reza. Uh, I'm a student from Beirut Chamber of Commerce. Uh, my question for you is uh, how can political affect a region and not just one country? Excuse me, can you repeat? How political can affect a region and not one country? Yes, okay. Well, the, the, the interesting thing in the Mediterranean is that uh, before it's split in different parts, very different, because of their tradition and because of their um, economic performance and, and, well, you know all of that. But the interesting thing is that uh, there are extraordinary complementarities. And it is upon these complementarities that they can work to build this Euro-Mediterranean area of common progress, understanding, uh, etc. In most of these countries, although uh, in a varying degrees, because some other some are more uh, attached or yes bound with the European Union area, as uh, the Maghreb countries. More than 70% of their trade, as you know, is done from Morocco, etc., uh, Tunisia, even Algeria, etc., with the European Union countries. And countries in the Middle East, it is the most important trade they have, but to a lesser extent because they have more relations as well with the Gulf area and so on. But the point is that, from a commercial point of view, their main partner, for all of them is the European Union. The main investor is the European Union and they have opportunities because they have other cheaper resources, etc., which may attract investment. They have flourishing, well, they have, and let's hope they will have again flourishing tourism, uh, tourist sector. The clients are mainly European, so it's a, it's a, it's a, a source of, uh, to create jobs, to have foreign currency, to pay for the necessary uh, imports uh, for, for the general working of the country, especially in the process for industrialization. Emigrants go mainly from these countries to Europe, and therefore the remittances are very important for these countries. Uh, and they are mainly sent by their nationals working in the European Union. Uh, we might go one by one the countries to see, some as, uh, in, as in the eastern part of the Mediterranean are more related, as I say, relatively to the Gulf area. Uh, but for all of them, therefore, the remittances of their emigrants working abroad are very important. Maghreb countries is almost exclusively by workers working in the European Union, in the uh, Eastern Mediterranean countries, is shared uh, some working, some of them in the European Union, many others in the Gulf countries. But for all of them, uh, uh, the situation would be similar. It was calculated and is now calculated that uh, a country I am taking as an example, Morocco, uh, uh, foreign remittances may, may, may reach uh, like 8% of the GNP, which is an enormous thing. Eh? Uh, so uh, uh, you see these kind of complementarities. We have demographic complementarities, as you know. We have in Europe an aging population. Uh, by the way, for example, I have eight seconds left. Uh, uh, to see this kind of social modernization, if I may use that word, that anthropologists wouldn't like uh, social uh, modernization. But let me take just a very simple figure. At the time of independence for Tunisia and Morocco, for example, 
the average of uh, children per woman was about 7.3, 7.4. Now it is, seven, uh, for both countries, well, for Tunisia is 2.1 and for Morocco 2.2. In Europe we are below replacement level and so uh, we, without immigration uh, we don't know who would pay for the uh, uh, not my pensions, but for people a bit younger than me. Yeah. So we need young population to come to Europe for very simple economic reasons. Somebody to work here because there are opportunities and to contribute to the, to the social system so that pensions can be paid. Very uh, bluntly expressed. Uh, although people sometimes don't understand these very simple things. Eh? But this kind of complementarities, uh, I was taking uh, this to explain to what extent we are a single region and we have to work with that, those complementarities because your question was how is it that one thing in one country affects the others because of all of this. Thank you. Next question. Hi, my name is Beatriz. I am a teacher from Fundación Valencia Port, Port from? of Valencia. Fundación Valencia Port, uh, uh, Port of Valencia. And my question is, uh, how is the actual world affecting to the logistics of the Mediterranean? Excuse me, can you repeat? Yes. How is the actual world, the world between Ukraine and Russia, affecting the logistics in the Mediterranean? Yeah. Well, we are, you, you, you belong to the world of uh, logistics, right? So I will tell you something which is uh, very, I think, interesting to understand a lot of things in the Mediterranean. Mediterranean was uh, old fashioned until recently. So we see this museum, medieval things navigation in the Mediterranean in, in the Middle Ages or in the antiquity, etc. Because then the Atlantic was the important thing since the discovery of the Americas. And most recently, in, in the 20th century and on uh, the Pacific. Now, with the economic growth of China, the interesting thing is that, and I have asked one of my sons who's working in that field too. Uh, which is the shortest way between for, for, for navigation, uh, for containers, for example, uh, between Hong Kong and New York? In nautic miles, it's about the same. It's two or three percent difference. And in terms of price of the freight, it depends on the companies, but some companies prefer to go all the way through the Indic, Red Sea, uh, uh, Suez Canal, Mediterranean, and then to the main markets for Chinese exports, which is Europe in the first place, by the way, and then United States. I mean to the eastern coast of the United States, which means that nowadays, mainly because of the economic growth of China, the Mediterranean is again the center of the world. Because it's the, 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 the lane, the, the way uh, through which uh, most merchandise are shipped around the world. Eh? Uh, and now we are going to your question, which was, okay. So it is a key point, and now we have a war in the middle, well, not in the middle, but inside of the middle of this, of this war. No? And we have seen uh, uh, this, in the first place, these consequences uh, in terms of uh, energy, uh, in terms of uh, uh, agricultural products, but I think that the main consequences uh, stem from political uh, reasons. Because if you take the energy, which 
was a huge problem, etc. Uh, I always thought since the beginning, and I wrote it, that the, there would be a shift in, in, the, in the flows in the international trade of oil mainly and gas, so that Europeans would stop progressively but very rapidly buying Russian gas and oil, uh, but Russia would find new markets in China and India mainly because they would buy the oil and gas from Russia and therefore not that much from the Gulf area and so we would buy more to the Gulf and to other countries as Nigeria or the United States, which is now a net exporter of, of oil and gas, uh, and other countries as Venezuela, etc. So there is a kind of rotation, and the impact is then almost progressively zero. There is a rearrangement of who are the suppliers and, and the buyers, uh, but progressively the system the whole system uh, of energy flows in the world is, is rotating, but with a zero effect. Well, let's say zero effect. Uh, of course, meantime, for a very long time, you'll have disturbances. Uh, uh, for, the, for the grain and cereals, it was complicated, but uh, finally, as you know, the, uh, the agreement was reached mainly brokered by, by Turkey. We would have uh, a lot to talk about the uh, geopolitics in the Mediterranean, not only the impact of, uh, well, you know, all the kind of uh, retreat that was being done by the United States because they, they give more importance to the, to the China and the Pacific, etc. But the point is that uh, um, with the war, heavily everything depends on the result. And the result can, can be no good, in fact, eh? because, because the, 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 the damage that has been done to the possibility of uh, having a peaceful, cooperative Europe is very high. Uh, although we'll have to find an arrangement with Russia because uh, it is too important uh, as a European country to, to, to forget about Russia. But we have to, do, to help Ukraine, because otherwise, uh, we, at the invasion of Ukraine, we were at the point in '39 when Hitler invaded Poland. After uh, the rearmament, remilitarization of the Ruhr, the invasion of the Sudetes territories in, in Czechoslovakia and in, in other areas there, the Anschluss with Austria, and you know that Chamberlain said, no, we have a peaceful for, for, us, for a generation. But then finally came the invasion of Poland and the rest of the countries had to react and, 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 and the war started. So uh, we have to <coughs> help the Ukrainians and probably will have to have a deal <coughs> in, with Russia, possibly after Putin, I don't know, what will happen inside Russia. With the premises, I imagine, <coughs> that Ukraine would join the European Union, but not NATO, forever and having a kind of status similar to the, the one that traditionally had Austria, for example, that joined recently, let's say, the United States as a, as a neutral area uh, in Central Europe, with the guarantee that it, will not join, it would not join uh, uh, NATO. But we would have above that an arrangement pan-European we have to integrate Russia into a general stability system of Europe with what kind of 
checks and balances and guarantees. This is the central point. But of course, uh, now both parties think they can win the war, so incentive to negotiate. Destruction is going on, unfortunately, and uh, at some point it will have to stop and to break a deal. But probably President Putin will not be able to accept anything that may be perceived as a defeat. A defeat of his project, not a defeat of Russia. Uh, Russia goes back to Vladivostok. So it has, it has really, uh, to defeat Russia, nobody could. Napoleon, Hitler, etc., you name it. Eh? But politically and in that territory, uh, possibly, possibly, uh, well, it depends. If Trump wins the election in America, then Ukraine has a big, 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 big problem. And Europe. Yes. Thank you for answering your complicated question. Well, thank you very much. We have, we ah, have we just, still have another we question. We just have okay. one last question. Okay, 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 excuse me. Huh? That's okay. Uh, okay. Hello, sir. Okay, you can hear me? Yes. I'm Marco Musci, uh, coordinator of uh, Scholar Europea in Ports of Rome. So my question to you is, yes, uh, yes, I'm Italian. <laughs> so uh, my question to you is the, is the following. Uh, what are the key strategies uh, you employ uh, to promote uh, cooperation and mutual understanding in the Mediterranean? Thank you. Yes, well, that's, that's uh, what I was explaining. Uh, that's what's about Barcelona process, well, now generally called Euro Mediterranean Partnership, with these two projections. Eh? We have uh, European, neighborhood, Euro -Mediterranean, European neighborhood policy, which is uh, uh, the bilateral track of the European Union with each one of the countries. Uh, there are some financial funds which in my view would have to multiply it by a factor of 10, by the way. Uh, uh, but the, let's say that the European Commission is spending every year about uh, 1.4 billion euros uh, in that financial cooperation with countries south of East, south and east of the Mediterranean. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and then you have these commercial arrangements, eh? uh, these bilateral free trade areas that we have, instead of having a general one, as I was saying before, uh, a euro Moroccan free trade area, a euro Tunisian free trade area, a euro Egyptian free trade area, etc., with a fact that it's only for industrial products and not completed. It excludes agricultural products which have specific arrangements. It is not that it is forbidden, the trade of course, but there is, that follows another system which is not aiming to, uh, uh, but it, that should be changed to have really a, a, a free uh, trade area. And, uh, and then all this uh, technical and financial assistance to reform. To reform means the policies. It is policy oriented all the time. But policies and governments, it is not only, it is important, about promoting democracy, uh, human rights, etc. Governments, go uh, governance, is as well uh, a sound budgetary policy, uh, a good social protection policy, a good um, educational system that works, a good uh, sun uh, health system, etc. So the reform of all these things, or a uh, good legislation that, that attracts investment instead of having a kind of legislation that uh, keeps the investors away. Uh, so this is, this is uh, the, the array of tools 
that we use. And on top of that, let's not forget uh, what I said before, civil society involvement in that process. I mean, uh, uh, we are talking about bringing together countries and peoples from north and south of the Mediterranean. Uh, and to build that, as we said in 95 already, and it's still valid, of course, uh, uh, to, to build around the Mediterranean area of peace and stability, uh, shared economic progress, and intercultural dialogue and understanding, etc. No? And, and to build that, you, you need to, to work together uh, with the a clear idea that the future of all of us depends on that. Because even north of the Mediterranean, it is clear that, that in the long run, that say the welfare system that exists in Europe, which is unique in the world, by the way, uh, you have no social protection comparable in America or in any other place. Uh, uh, it is not sustainable in the midst of uh, countries uh, with, with incredible problems <coughs> in many respects. So we have to uh, work together so that they can rise to a standard uh, of living in all respects that is compatible with, that, with those general goals that I was uh, saying of uh, peace and stability, uh, shared economic progress and intercultural dialogue. With no, with no progress toward a more uh, egalitarian situation, it is, it is not sustainable. Right? We have advanced. As I said before, we had some progress, but it is not enough. Uh, and, and therefore, in quantitative terms, a 1% growth of 30 thousand uh, uh, euros per capita average, let's say, in Europe. One percent growth is much higher in absolute terms than uh, four percent growth of uh, 2,000 euros per, per, per year, per capita. So in quantitative terms, although the rate of growth in the South may be higher than in Europe, Let's say that in Europe it is now 1.5%, uh, and in the South, let's suppose it was, which is not in, in average, 3.5%. Uh, Nevertheless, the actual, in quantitative terms of difference in euros per capita or dollars per capita, is grow, uh, bigger at every year. Eh? It's clear that. And so we need to, to have a higher rate of growth in the South. That's it, which is not easy. We, you, need, you need peace, you need stability, you need reform of the legislations, uh, you need to uh, bring about reforms in the institutions, in the legislation, uh, in the educational system, etc., etc., which cannot be done from one day to the next morning. But I am convinced, at least, uh, uh, that the only way uh, in, for the countries uh, south and east of the Mediterranean to achieve that is in association with the European Union, which is its natural par partner at the other side, where its markets are, where the remittances come, where the tourists come, and the investments, and, and this is the basis of their progress. Now Chinese are uh, around, etc. But Chinese have a different approach. Uh, by the way, all the Red, uh, Belt and Road Initiative, which is very famous now because they are building many things uh, everywhere. These are loans. And the debt is increasing at an incredible rate in the whole of Africa, in the whole, north and, and, and south of the uh, Sahara, uh, which will be a, a huge program, uh, problem and the Chinese, uh, well, they are nice fellows, but they don't care about the progress of the countries. Uh, they, they care about business. Uh, I, I never understood how it could be a communist country for so long. The Chinese is always thinking about a business. <laughs> so it's incompatible. <laughs> but, well, they, they, they were under 
uh, uh, a communist regime for very long, and then they, they, they have this in, incredible uh, growth that we are mentioning before in, uh, because of the reforms they introduced.